last week, somebody asked me a question after looking through the United News. And he said, um, I looked through, I flipped through this, and what I could see inside is mostly pictures and activities of white people. And I said, you probably didn't flip through enough. If you flip through enough, you will see pictures of both black and white people, and there are black people also. And I said, but first, I think you need to understand that in the church of God, the scripture says there are neither male nor female, Jews or Greek, and there's neither white nor black. We are all God's children. You need to understand that, and I need to understand that. What we need to be concerned about is what God expects us to know and how he expects us to see things. And don't worry yourself about maybe how other people see things. And then I opened and I showed some of the places where we have the youth camp pictures for Ghana and for Togo. And some from, I think, some of the other East African places. Most of the other places are still having their feasts, I mean their camp. Some are having their camp, frankly, in November, some are in December. And our own uh, camp ended 30th of August. The UIC newsletter was already in print by then. And it got to them, I think, on the first week of September. So it's obviously probably coming out in the next edition. And then he said, okay, what the activities, what about activities? I mean, what don't we have activities? And I said, well, we do have activities. The thing is, sometimes I don't bother taking the pictures or us putting together materials or articles and sending some of those local activities. And I said, perhaps maybe I might consider sending some of them. I said, if you are also familiar with the church, you will also be aware of certain things. That there are some congregations, for example, most of the information that you see on the United News often come from those ministers who are closely uh, in activities around those the home office. For example, Peter Edinson, who was here 2009, I think. <clears throat> 2009. Peter Edinson is a media manager and he is a media person. And so you will often see a lot of information about TV programs and radio programs and other things. And you'll see a lot of activities about this congregation that's there. Ken Murray. Is, in, is, an, is a minister in Australia. You wouldn't see much of what he has on the United News. Not because he doesn't have activity in Australia, in Sydney, or Claremont, and the congregation of the pastors. But Kemore probably is the pastor that has the most material on the internet. He has on YouTube, he has on Vimeo, he has on uh, Skype, he has many places. He does weekly recordings, he sends out articles, but it's more or less events and issues around again, not even mostly what he does in Australia, even though he puts even his own activity, like they decide one, one Sabbath that the entire congregation in Claremont will decide they want to go keep the Sabbath in one mountain in Central Australia. And all of them, two days before, everybody moved to that mountain. And they stayed there one day, two days, and then on the Sabbath, the cab service there. And they will have a video recording of it. And then in the afternoon, on Sunday, everybody comes back to their congregations. Um, a lot of activities take place in Spokane as well, where Mr. Mikkelsen is. They have uh, ski resorts around them. And they have mountain resorts where it is, it's snow all through the year. And they go and have dances. They have costume parties where people will dress. I remember the last one. Uh, Paul dressed like Star Trek and he wore the uniform of uh, the first officer, the red uniform of the red first officer of Star Trek. And he had the insider of the United Federation Planet, the one they would touch like, he was a character enterprise. He has it on his chest. And his wife, Darla, dressed like Miss Piggy of the Muppet Show. She does really look like Miss Piggy. And someone dressed like Muppet the, Muppet the Frog. And then someone would, so they also have costume activities. Sometimes after church, they will have dance or they will have a potluck. And they have all those activities 
But you will not see Spokane report any of those activities in the United Nations. Because Mr. Mikkelsen personally does not believe that every time you call, take a picture, take a video, and send it, he doesn't feel it's necessary. The people locally that know that we're doing this. Um, he's also not an electronic person. Mr. Mikkelsen has a really nice phone for many years, but it's always off. <laughs> It's always off. It doesn't put it on. Because he said, if I'm at home and people need to see me, they know where my house is. Come and see. If I'm visiting people, I'm with them. People who I'm not with, if they want to see me, they know where my house is. And you know what? If they want to call me, if there's any problem, I'm sure if they can't get me, they'll solve that problem on their own. When he leaves the house, he says. When he knows he's coming back, there's no reason for him to have a phone. So Michelle wants to get a hold of me. Oh, I'm sure there are people around that she can easily talk to. He doesn't believe in using phone. He bought a computer and then later an iPhone. I started coming to Nigeria and we move around. And he started seeing the advantage of how you can use technology to do things. So now he can't go anywhere without his laptop. Then he has an iPhone. But you know what he uses the iPhone for? Hotspot, internet. He doesn't even turn it on, even when he's in the US. He doesn't turn it on. Paul Moody is a close second. Paul started going online. He never had a Facebook account for years. I'm not sure if he has one now. His wife has. Okay? His wife has. And he will often piggyback on Dala. He will be looking at her comments occasionally, but he will never comment. Um, for a number of years before he became started working in the ministry. I only talk to Paul when he comes to Nigeria. I send emails to him during the intervening years, saying how oh, everything has worked, and Paul will not report, reply. Not because he doesn't like to reply. He's just someone who doesn't see the need for online technology. He uses computer just to click to manage the accounts of his business. But as he started taking more and more jobs in the ministry, as he comes to Africa, people start asking him, especially his families and other people at home. Africa to them is like an adventure. We want to know what is happening. We want to know where you are going. So he started keeping what's called a travel port. And I think, if I, I can't remember correctly, either last year or so, he eventually had to open a, 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 a Facebook account. But for years, he never had a Facebook account. He is someone also who is young. Paul is, I think, 44, 45. But he, he thinks technology, I don't think I want to talk technology, as much as possible, what is the old thing is still good enough for me. And he uses technology only because he has to. So you won't see a lot of the activities that he, take, that he do actually featuring in the United News. There are very few you see featuring in the United News. Um, so I explained to the chap that this is good. It's important people want to connect. It's a worldwide family and people want to know what's happening over the world. And it's good. But the thing is that if every church area in the world begins to send in pictures, video, articles, and everything concerning the things they do on a regular basis, I think the United News will probably be as thick as this. But thankfully, for those who are in the media, those who are in uh, uh, in various areas within the church and have the opportunity and the ability and of course they have the bandwidth and the resources to take pictures, write materials about programs and activities and they put it online and you know what, it's good. At least for those who are able to, they, they still do so. And I say, you know, it's probably right. We don't have much coming from Africa. It's not as if they don't want to put it there, just that it doesn't come. Okay? So I said, okay, I think I probably will try. And then I brought up an example. For example, look at our UCD website. It's currently not active for quite a couple of months. Uh, I designed the website years and years ago, I think 2001, 2002. I maintained it uh, at the time when I had my sister who was working almost as a de facto PA when she was doing her program class. Often work on it and put materials. There are tons of emails, tons of um, Questions people often ask that have to be answered. I still have no choice and to answer that. Even this morning, I still have to respond to at least four emails. And then to put materials on the, on the website, there was a time I solicited for articles from members to be putting, um, putting various articles on the website. If I remember correctly, I think NOSA 
was probably the only person who sent in articles a number of times. And then it gets to the point, you know what? Uh, we stop putting articles on it. And then it becomes just information. People can go there and see a little information. They can download book class and materials. And then we now decide to change it to be a bit more interactive, put sermon, sermon transcripts, sermon videos, and then we need to compress the videos. We've been taking videos since about, I think, January or so now. And the videos need to be compressed. They need to be transcribed, that is, into text form. And uh, it has to be up up uploaded. Events or pictures or various things need to be put, like our church social, like the latest uh, program that they did one time ago when they were having uh, uh, how to do soap making and then the seminar we had, was it in this, early this year or sometime, whatever, I can't remember, on the uh, creating wealth and hope. Some of those things, we need people to put it online. I uh, moved the host to another host that was fairly cheaper and offer a little bit more uh, compression times of bandwidth, preparing for us when we want to do cybercast. I told you I already got a space with the CGC to cybercast our sermons so that we can directly be services live. And anybody who wants to connect by Skype or internet can do so. I already have the space. I uh, got the system that we use for it. Got the camera. This camera is good enough that we can use for it. And then, of course, it requires a couple of other software. Uh, the software, one of the software is going to cost almost like 2,800 US dollars. Once you buy the software, you bought the software. And then, of course, if you want to use cloud-based software, we pay something like about 15 to 20 dollars per month for it. so it's better you just buy your own, isn't it? But those are not getting those things together is not the issue. I think it's the maintainers, someone to take ownership, and for people who can be involved to take ownership and responsibility and be committed to it. And I said, so over time I've sort of like eased up on some of those things, and it still needs to be done. Now there are so many times we've all also organized activities at church. We ask for volunteers to teach the youth, the youth activities at camp. Sometimes we actually draft people into it. We organize church social for a number of years, and um, sometimes some people will turn up, some people will not turn up. We organize seminars, we organize workshops, we organize uh, skill development, or we want to do some local activity, maybe it's clean up. And of course, there are those who will not turn up, and there are those who will turn up. We're not so many, isn't it? that if we have a program and maybe about a third do not turn up, and just a few turn up, it's, uh, it's still good that people do turn up. But when they, maybe about a third or about half do not turn up, it sometimes is a little bit discouraging. And then I told the guy, one of the reasons I also look at is that we are all living scattered across various places. It's not like the average typical church where People can leave their house and walk two steps or two buildings and they're in their church. Some of us live so far away and we know the condition of the economy as it is. So for people coming from Korodu or people coming from K2 or people coming from Maitu or Surulere, are there times when people come all the way from Aja? Or people coming from Via? And so for them to come together so frequently, oftentimes it's a lot of resources on them. And all those things make it a little bit um, uh, difficult to organize a lot of activities and a lot of things on a more regular basis. Uh, this, the thing again is if we, at uh, the time we used to have club, and then we have um, seminary class, when we used to have seminary class and club on a Sunday, uh, because of the constraints of costs and transport and schedules, it is preferred often by many over time that you know, let's just do it after service. And guess what? Even when we want to have programs after service, considerable yes, it costs a lot of time during the week moving around, and then on Saturday people come again. People don't want to spend half the day in church. Maybe you stay till four or five. We say there are of course those who, as soon as we say amen, five, ten minutes, fifteen minutes after, they're heading out. And so we have to look at the fact that the reason why some leave. It's not necessarily because they don't want to stay. Of course, there are those who have things to do after service, but there are those who are looking at the traffic when going back home. And looking at the fact that towards 4 or 5, when a lot of people have gone for weddings and burials and other parties on Saturday, they are all going back home. And the cost of transport is, is high. So there are multi, multifaceted reasons why actually we do not have as much activity as those in the US or in the UK. 
And I said, not even not, not in the US, in the US and Europe. In UK, frankly, they are worse than us. For years, they had no youth camp. Youth camp started there about three years ago in the UK. And I kind of told the minister, the minister is fairly old too, he's in his 70s, Frank Javis. And I said, how come you guys don't have youth camp in the entire United Kingdom? For those who can afford to, because camp abroad is not free. The parents pay for their campus. You can go online to UIC and download the broker, and you'll see youth camp fee per child, per campus. You can see as much as $300 and as low as $150. Even staff, you often pay. And in some cases, they, sub they supplement staff uh, fee to be at camp. And the staff are coming to serve at camp. So I, for those who can afford to, they send their children to go attend camp in Europe or in other parts of Europe, or the ones that camp, maybe in the US. And I said, what is wrong with you guys? You cannot attend, you cannot keep camp in the United Kingdom. The whole of the United Kingdom. And we might be thinking, what? You know the whole of France, how big France is. You know how many members of UCG are in France? Anybody want to guess? 50, 100, 120, 200, 4. Uh -huh. Four in the whole of France. Four. And guess what? Team Pebwat, Mrs. Pebwat, Jimmy and Mark, and the two children. Yes, husband and wife and the two children. <laughs> and it's been there for years, for decades. Okay? It's been there for decades. So, now why am I bringing up all of this? The discussion I had that last week started me thinking that, you know, the scripture did say, do not be tired of doing what is good, isn't it? If something is good to do, just keep doing it. Sometimes the truth is, it gets a little bit to me when programs or something is organized at some expense and you see very few people turn up. Sometimes what gets a little to me is the fact that those who do not turn up do not even have the courtesy to say, you know what, you know what, this is the issue I have. Previously engaged, I have this issue. I'll not be there. People will just not turn up. Okay? I remember listening to the church beside me. And they want to have a problem. They say, you know, on Tuesday and Wednesday, we have this program that we're going to do in the church. And everybody should be there. If you are not there, God is going to punish your life. Your business will not do well. If you see your children falling sick tomorrow, or you see your business is not doing well, it's because you did not put your mind to attend God's program that we're having on Tuesday and Wednesday. Make sure everybody is there Tuesday, Wednesday. And I used to listen to that, and it used to irritate me that. How can these people be doing this? You know, whatever the Bible, the Bible whatever is not of faith is what? If you force people, even sometimes I get a little bit confused or undecided what to do. Somebody doesn't turn up at church for months. First week, second week, I'll call. Hey, how's everything? Are you okay? Yeah, there's no problem. Oh, you know, nothing. I'm okay. I just have some things to do. I'm reluctant to keep calling so frequently. You know why? You keep calling frequently. You know, how's everything? I didn't see you yesterday. I hope no problem. Before you know it, the person like, this man will start to me again, did you come? Let me try, this come. Even if it's once every two weeks, at least, so that I can say it's, that I was there last week now. And then the person comes, not because they want to, but because if they don't come, ah. It's like, come on, start calling me, ah, what's it happened? This is you last week now. And you know, it's calling because I wasn't at church. Even if you call, I say, so how are you now? How's everything? Say, everything's going well, so everything's fine. They'll think in their mind, ah, it's like, come on, calling me, because I didn't, I didn't go to church yesterday. Or, And I know that if anybody attends service because anybody pressures them or pushes them to attend, the blessing and the benefit of being there, they don't really get it because it's not of faith. It is not of faith. And God loves those who give either of worship or resources or time cheerfully. He loves a cheerful giver. So why am I bringing all this up? There's a program that, uh, how many of you have had what is called the Deuteronomy 6? Youth Instruction Program. See? Nobody. I told the guy again who was asking me here last week. 
As a one other reason, I don't bother often sending these materials. Apart from the fact that all some of these reasons I've given you, and frankly, it's because I myself see what's the point, okay? What's the point? Is that I doubt whether 5% of the congregation reads the United News or the Give News when they get it. I think people collect it. Wow, beautiful printing and beautiful wherever, wherever. Perhaps the printer will admire it for the printing technology. The artists will admire it for the visual, artistic, whatever. And the teachers will admire it for the summary they will read in this topic. And you know what? Everybody just gets home. As long as you collect it, get home, dump it somewhere. Nobody gets to read them. Even on the Saturday, that is supposed to be a day that God says, today, give it to me, all right? Don't do any survival work. People get home, guess what? TV is on, and things like that. They watch TV Monday to Friday. Bible says don't watch TV on the Sabbath, okay? But the times of the way that at least people could spend the time, let's me bring out this good news. They're busy catching up on old news. That's when some people are busy visiting friends and families or whatever, whatever. And they don't even get to read those United News or the good news, or the Beyond Today. They don't read them. And if they don't, Africa, we don't have a culture of reading. I can count when I enter public transport, and the number of times I take public transport out, just for the sake of it, because I have things to read on my iPad. And I have books that I bought that I want to read. Some are hard cover books that I have, hard copy books, and some are soft copy that I have there. And I, when you drive yourself around, you have, you have at various companies working, you don't get to read. So I want to read. So I will enter public transport and go out. And when I'm walking up, I'm stacking up. How are you? How are you? Uh, what is wrong with your motto? What is wrong with your motto? It's like, it's, a, it's like you have a car. You shouldn't be going around into public transport. I it diminishes you. And so, Africa, when I'm in the bus, I cannot I can count in six months. I don't think I have seen up to two people in six months in a public transport that I see who are reading in a public transport. We do not have the culture of reading. In the UK, enter the subway. People are packed so tight that our mole, in fact, that's almost the equivalent of mole there. People are packed so tight that you will be doing like this. So hold your hand and hold something to stand up. And yet you see people who have, in that place where they are held like that, they have a book in their hand and they are reading. And those who do not have books, you see them having Kindles, they them having their phone, they have having e-book, they have notes. In fact, the number of tablets proliferated in the US and in the UK, in Europe, mostly not because of games or whatever, but because of books. It is Barnes and Nobles, and this other W.H. Smith and Co. that actually, and, and Amazon, they popularized tablets. They started them as reading materials. First as reading materials, things you can use to put a lot of books inside and you read. So we do not have a reading culture in Africa. And we need to change all of that. So we really need to improve. In 2014, in May, those of you who still have your United News of that period, go look at them. And it's been featured and discussed in several United News articles over the past two years. So it's almost two years that that Deuteronomy 6 Youth Instruction Program has been around. How many of you have seen the family study guides, the youth study guides on the UCG website, member website? It's many. Let me see if I can show you. There are many, many of them. But we do not have a culture of reading. We probably will. All of these, all of these that you are seeing here, these are family study guides. This is not for children. This is for adults. They are for adults. And they've been on the website for quite a number of time, almost two years. Then over the past 10 years, how many people know the number of youth instructional materials are on the website? There are over 250 on the website. Over 250. 
and then study guides that are to help individuals learn the Bible, become better teachers so that they can better be able to actually teach others, to improve their knowledge of God's Word and be able to pass it across to others, instructional materials for those who want to teach and understand God's Word first, to understand it themselves, and then to teach it. There are over 150 on the website. Now, there are very few people in this room who probably do not have a phone that can browse. If you have a phone in this room that cannot browse, let's show by raise of hands. Anybody in this room who have a phone that cannot browse? No, raise up your hands. Serious. Three people, four people, who have a phone that cannot browse. Now, I can see someone there say raise your hand, but if you have a tablet that can browse, raise up your hand. <laughs> ah, so you should raise up your hand so you don't have a phone that cannot browse. You have a device that can browse. <laughs> okay? It is a digital age. Are you understanding? It's a digital age. If we do not move with the times, we will not just get left behind. We will actually become irrelevant. We will become irrelevant. One of the things that made Ms. Mikkelsen adopt using laptops, to so the point where he now has two MacBooks, one that sits permanently in his office and one that he takes around with me everywhere, was when he comes to Nigeria and we are going to travel around three weeks on the road. Sometimes he comes four days ahead so that he can give his body time to adjust to the time zone. Because when they're sleeping, normally in the US, we're awake. And when we're awake, they're sleeping. So by the time he gets to Nigeria, he gets to Nigeria during the daytime. But his body is thinking he's still in the US and he's wanting to sleep. So he often will give himself, he said it takes him two days or so to adjust to Nigerian time zone. I think when you're younger, you probably don't have that much problem. I've traveled places and I just stay awake as much as everybody stays awake. So, the, how many of you have seen his, um, uh, there's this book Mr. Mikkelsen made, this uh, Topical Index. He's made like four editions. In two years, the first edition took him 10 years. He says his memory is not as sharp. Mr. Kellers has a very sharp memory. Mr. Kellers can yeah, say something about the Bible today. And Mr. Pella, Mr. Kellers can recollect, oh, yes, Matthew 6, 12, says so, so, and so. Oh, there's somewhere in Jeremiah, Jeremiah so, and so. He will recollect that somewhere. He can remember scripture. It's not everybody that has that ability. Mr. Mikkelsen, for God so loved the world, and he gave to his only begotten son. Where is it? He has to check aside for it. He doesn't even memorize John 3, 16. See? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember your creator, blah, blah, blah. Romans 12, 1. And Hebrews, some of those popular ones. He doesn't even remember them. He said because his memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So he decided to not let it be a disadvantage. So he started carrying tiny, tiny books, papers with him. And he'll write those scriptures inside and put it in there. So he keeps it in his pocket. So if he needs to, when he's going out visiting people or talking to people, he needs to remember something. He just brings them up, and he's identify them by topic. God's love the world, okay? And he wrote Romans 3, John 3, 16, uh, so, and he will just bring them up, and said they help him. So for him, that is, I mean, nobody's going to give him a reward or take away a word from him when he's talking to them. And he brings out his top card index, and he just flips through and says, for example, open Matthew 2, 4, and the person opens it, and the person's word is there. And in less than 20 seconds again, he flips through the next one. Okay, open Genesis, so and so. He's still doing what he's supposed to do. So uh, over time, those things started accumulating. And he started putting them together into a written form. So when he goes around visiting people, or when he's doing Bible study, people see him have a book. And he flips through, and those things are narrated by topic. And he says it helps him. So he now decided to use it and give other people as well. And said the first one to compile it together to be comprehensive, so that I want to study on any topic in the Bible. You can see all the scriptures about a particular topic. He said it took him ten years. Ten years. Then he came to came to Nigeria, and we move around a lot. 
and we have discussions, and people are bringing up people are bringing up questions, and I can just say no, okay, this, and as they are saying those things, I remember, okay, let's turn to this place, let's turn to this place, let's turn to this place. How can I remember those things? Say, so, well, I have a near photographic memory. If I read something, I rarely forget. And if something is important and I note it, it's in my mind. And then, as I'm also a digital person, times when some I say, well, that, that statement you are saying is not correct, sir. Or maybe we're discussing with someone. The person is misquoting somewhere in the scripture. I say, okay, what you are reading is somewhere in Jeremiah. And I open my and I find this place in Jeremiah. I said, well, how do you know Jeremiah? Oh, I know it's in Jeremiah. But where exactly in Jeremiah, I do not know. I just need to use my phone and I'll get it. And he started realizing, so you can use technology for this. Then one day, he sat in the house two days while I was finishing up some business before we traveled. And I left my laptop with him. And he realized he could actually search using a Bible software and get tons of material and other topics that he would probably have taken maybe two weeks to find out. He was like, you mean, so you, all these hours and hours and hours I've been using to do this, that I'll use weeks before I can get, you mean I can have gotten this on it? In that two days, Mr. Mikhail seen God's and a new edition of his topical index. The first topical index, those of you have seen it, the brown one was about a half an inch, right? In two days, Mr. Mikkelsen doubled it. That when the other when it was coming out, it became a full one inch. In two days, he said he was already thinking to take him at least six years or five years or more to get it out. So we need to develop and advance with the times, okay? And take advantage of every available opportunity. We actually need to adopt some of these things and simply change the way we do things. I mentioned the uh, I mentioned the Deuteronomy 6 youth instruction for two reasons. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this we need to adopt. And in adopting this, the church recommends everybody be a part of it. But obviously we know everybody will not necessarily be a part of it. But it would be good if everybody can be a part of it. And we need to increase and step up our level of activity as well. And I personally will stop looking at the fact that when activities or programs have been organized, sometimes half the congregation will not be a part of it. And not, not let that actually be a discouraging point from organizing. But still do it. It's, it's a decision that I have actually come to. Because we all have excuses why we cannot do things. The reason I'm bringing this up is that when I got home, that last week, I was replaying in my mind. There's something that I learned years and years ago. They say it sharpens the memory. I learned it in the health and longevity. And instinctively, subconsciously, I still do it. When you see Arnold Schwarzenegger, we know Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah. muscular guy. He didn't become like that by carrying balloon, no. It was a concentrated effort, carrying weight with what he eats and exercising, and he builds his muscles. People who compete in the Olympics will spend an entire three, four years preparing for that event. Those who play well in football, why do they complain that they don't come to training or they don't come to camp? If they can only play once every few months and then go and play in the major leagues, I don't think that would be a big issue. But they have to train and train and train and train. Well, our brain is a supercomputer. Its major job is processing that is computational activities, where it takes information, turns them around, and brings out something useful. And we can interpret something, and we, that's what the brain is for. Well, we say brains are different, and that's true. Part of it is because brains are also used differently. Why there are genetic factors, in which case some people are born with an innate ability to be intelligent and smart. That is true. But what is also proven by genetics, is that environment can combine with that innate ability to produce something beyond. You get someone who is the child of a professor, two professors, has the, techno has the gene to be smart and intelligent. Put that child in an environment where the people the child interacts with are dollars. And that child will be a dull child. But put a dull child in an environment where there are people who are smart and intelligent. 
and interacts around them and expose that child to things that will push that child's intelligence, the child will be a super intelligent person. That's also proven. So if we want to improve our brain, we can do so. In that book, Health and Longevity, it says every evening before you sleep, no matter how tired you are, unless you are so tired that as soon as you hit the bed, five minutes or two minutes you are gone. But if you lie down and you have 10, 15 minutes before sleep catches you, don't just lie there and close your eyes and let your mind wander. Start thinking from the morning. What did you do from morning till that day? Whatever you can think to until sleep catches you up. You're actually exercising your brain and improving your brain's ability to excel at remembering things, computational things, and cognitive or logical reasoning. So uh, that evening, as I was subconsciously just going through the events of the day, I got to the part of my discussion with this individual, and it's elongated, and I started looking at it, and I came to the community, you know what? Actually, everything I was saying to this person was excuses. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Okay, we don't have people who could take over the website and take ownership. It's still an excuse, right? I still have time to watch TV. <laughs> I still watch movies occasionally. It's a great time to watch movies. I still sit down and watch and play and watch things on my iPad. I mean, read books on my iPad. Sometimes it's a question of choices. They might be valid excuses, but they're still worth all the same it's excuses. So I've been talking for like 20 minutes. It doesn't sound like a sermon, does it? <laughs> okay. It is in the end. The title is Excuse, Excuses, Excuses. What's your own? <laughs> Let's turn to maybe our first scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. One of the things we need to adopt as part of the activities, and of course, each of us will need to look at it and ask ourselves, okay, what's my excuse for not being a part of this? And every time now we're going to organize activities or our programs, each person, each of you should simply be thinking, okay, what's going to be my excuse for not being a part of this? Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 6. In the New King James, and then I'll read it in the Amplified Version, because the Amplified Version tries to take the intent, the meaning of the Hebrew word, to now amplify, to blow it up, so that we can see what it's intended to be. Verse 6, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. These words, this is God speaking to the children of Israel. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. When you bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. The church is moving away from instruction of children in Sabbath schools which is the responsibility of those who have been assigned to do so, or those who have volunteered to do so, to getting the parents themselves involved. Now, it is not the job of the pastor. It is neither the job of the youth instructional leaders or the people who volunteer at summer schools to teach your children and my children the things of God. It's not their job. God says, Parents are to first understand what he has taught them. That's why it says, this one shall be in your heart. Let me read it in the Amplified Version. Let me read it in the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version reads, And this word which I am commanding you this day shall be first in your own minds and hearts. So God is telling you and myself that the words he is writing in the scriptures, it shall be first in my mind and in my heart in your heart and in your mind. You have no excuse for not learning them. You have no excuse for not creating time to understand what God expects of you or what God has instructed us to know. No excuse. 
He said, it shall be first in your own minds and heart. Verse 7 says, then you shall wet, W-H-E-T, like when you want to sharpen something. You get a sharpening stone, you put water on it, so that it can be smooth when you're not passing the tin over it. He said, you shall wet and sharpen them. Which means the instruction and the knowledge and the doctrines and the teachings of God. You need to hone your skills, develop your understanding of this to the level that it is easy, that when you need to push them into your children, they will go in easily. When you sharpen a knife, when you, the, the Japanese have a sword, the short sword they call the katana. If you throw a piece of silk up and it's coming down, and they put the sword like this. If it lands on it, it will cut it into two. That's how sharp it is. So it says here, you shall wet and sharpen them so that you as to make them penetrate and teach and impress them diligently upon the minds and the hearts of your children. God didn't say the pastor should do so. He didn't say the youth instructional volunteers shall do so. He says the parents. The parents shall do so. How do we know it's the parents who will do this? Look at the next verse. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Pastor sits in your house with you. Instructional, you play that sits in people's house with them. Now, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, you are taking them to school, you are going to the market, you are driving around, you are in the kitchen, you are washing clothes downstairs, you are cooking in the kitchen. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Now, isn't that instruction to parents? That is instruction to parents. So parents have the responsibility. Over the years, I have seen people who will say that their children didn't remain in the church. And I say there's nothing they can do about it. Where were Moses' sons? How many mentioned, you know he had children, right? How many mentioned did you hear of them in the Bible? What of Samuel? Did he have children? Joel and Abijah, isn't it? Who? Oh, is it Joel and Abijah opening a mirror? Okay. It's Eli that has open Amira or Hophni and Phineas. Okay. I'm saying open Amira in case people forget. <laughs> Train up a child in the way that it should go. When it matures or when it grows up, it will not depart from you. Who's, who's, to whose instruction is that going to be? To the pastors? To the church? to the instructional leaders, it's to the parents. And know the greatest mistakes parents make. They're busy. They don't have the time to sit and teach their children and study with them. At the feast, adults and parents are busy fellowshipping with people or watching TV. They will prefer to have children. You go and pray with your friends. That they don't have time to sit with them. Okay, Monday to Friday, they go to school. You two go to work, you come back, you're tired. What of the Saturday that God says is his own? Why can't we take that time and use it extensively to develop ourselves and these children in the things of God? The Deuteronomy 6 youth instructional model is what the church is gradually pushing and moving into to allow individuals, both parents and those who do not even have children yet, in fact the entire congregation, to take responsibility for training the children for teaching the children. And tons of study materials have been provided. So first of all, equip parents and individuals with an ability to understand, because it says they must learn it first. And then they now pass it to their children. They pass it to their children. And so we're gonna to have to start this after the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? It's been on for quite some time. Like as I said, it's been in the United News Magazine for a number of times. And a number of times, I will often want to bring up the issue. And like, you know, you ask people, let's come together and let's do this. You will see out of the congregation of maybe 50 or so, you see maybe like 18 people will turn up. I have, this, I have the statistics of the number of workshops and seminars that has been organized on various areas, various things. And the number of those who attend. 
They're just, just, they're just those who simply have no time. They just have excuses, excuses, reasons why they just cannot. It's almost like, you know, the one that at least God did say we should attend. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Or say Sabbath is we come in on 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock we're done. We've done our duty. Stay for any this program. Come on Sunday for this program. Come on this program. I don't have time for ah work business. This this commitment commitment commitment. Excuses excuses. What are yours? Perhaps we should have a month, an excuse-free month. An excuse three months when everybody should be a part of everything. If we start with service, for example, maybe we need volunteers for camp. Ah, you know, I don't like to go on water, I don't know how to swim. Maybe we should have two camps then for people who don't like water. We'll keep camp right here. Perhaps we should keep camp right here where there's no water. I'm hoping they will attend or they will volunteer. For those who say that place is always too cold, we should just get blankets for them and warm clothes so that they won't feel cold. For those who say it might be too hot, maybe we should consider having a tent that will have air condition inside. And we make sure that, or we buy clothes that have air conditioning units. For those who don't even like to come to service regularly, Maybe we should make a fund available, okay? One month's service-free attendance. We print out a card, give it to them, give it to the conductor every time you enter. They should not collect money from you. Or we simply have to make money available so that they can always come to service. Maybe for those who say they have headache, we should simply make sure all the nurses and the doctors or the pharmacists among us have drugs available so that they can come with the headache and give them their drugs. And we have a bed at the back so that they need to sleep, they can sleep. Those who sleep during service, because they have been so busy during the week and they're tired and they, don't, they can't stay out during service, we can have the bed at the back so they can listen to some and sleep at the back of the room. <laughs> For those who, whatever excuses people have, I live so far away, Maybe we should build, we should rent hotels for them to live there and there. But they can come and stay with some of us who live close so that they can at least be able to attend service for a month. My point here is this. We always will find excuses. But excuses are just that, excuses. You know when people always use the word, I have no choice. You know that's not really true. Somebody has a gun to your daughter's head, and this might be shocking to you, to your wife's head. And they say, if you don't go and drop this bomb in Oshodi, I will kill your wife and your daughters. You must have seen that in movies, right? And the person will carry the bomb and leave it there. And his intention is to kill one million people he does not know because he wants to save his wife and child. And the statement is, I have no choice. But really, does the person really have no choice? Obviously, there's a choice. In most cases, when we say we have no choice, it's because the consequence of us deciding otherwise is not what we can take. And so we make a choice. And so let's not use the word we have no choice. We always have a choice. I know I've said this, and I'm not intending to sound callous, okay? I'm just trying to let us sort of like coalesce a little bit. So, uh, put in perspective some of our choices when we give excuses. There are people who will say that um, they can only afford to be at church maybe once in a month, or once in two months, or once in three months. And that's okay. God says we must give as we are able. And he says he loves it when we give cheerfully. It doesn't only include when it comes to giving material resources. Your time, your worship, your attention, and everything should be from the heart. However, how many people truly who have a job and work somewhere, how many of you have heard of someone who has a job somewhere and they don't go to work, maybe I can only go twice in a week 
because I don't have transport. I've seen people who they have not paid their salaries for six months, for five months, for four months. And there are those I know who have experienced that probably here. Those period, how many people of those, of those will say, you know, they've not paid my salary for two months. I don't think I'll go to work. When I want to pay my salary, I'll go to work. How many people do you think will do that? People will borrow. They will walk, isn't it? They will go into debt. Because they are hoping that at least eventually they'll pay us. They are grumbling, but they know if they don't go to work, they will still lose that job that they say is not. There might be a few bold ones who will just choose and say, you know what? This is not working for me. I beg, let me, let me not go to work again. But they make those choices and they stay home and they don't go to work. It doesn't mean money will still come, but money still come. Unless there's other sources or something else they are doing now that they are at least sure will better give them energy. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Excuses, excuses. What's our own? There are so many things that we need to do and so many things that can benefit us. If we don't get rid of excuses and be a part of it, I think we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot and doing ourselves a disservice. Let us all choose to recognize that God has brought us together for a purpose. And he's bringing us together so that we can edify one another. The Bible says your whole body will be fitly joined together and each part playing its own part. It doesn't happen when we have this mindset of, you know what? I have my own things to do. I have my own timetable. I can't be a part of this. I think we're shunting or stunting our growth. When we isolate ourselves or we take ourselves away from those things when those, those programs are done. Because they're not for God, they're for us, for our benefit. How many of us think if we don't come to church, it changes who God is? Does it change who God is? Does it make him less powerful? Does it make him less sovereign? You think if I don't come to church, or you don't come to church, you think God is, is annoyed with you, you say, hey, this person didn't come to church today. Ah, I'm not happy with him again. The Bible says why we were still sinners. We were still wicked, evil people. Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrated his love to us. His love is unconditional. It means it doesn't depend on what we do. So what is the purpose of all his laws is giving us then? It's for our good. See? When I am at church, I don't know about you. Doesn't mean every, in fact, in my list of excuses, for those who are coming to church, who don't like coming to church because they feel there are too many hypocrites, we can provide newspaper, I mean, a booklet for them and a pen, so that when they at least come, they can be writing the names of those, the names of those hypocrites down. And then they can take it home and pray about it to God so that God can deal with them. When I come to church, I get a boost and I get a blessing that I cannot define to you. I started coming to church, the church of God, at 16. And this is true at 16. Between then and now, I can count in this hand in this hand, the number of times I have missed church. In this hand, that means I have less than five times when I have not been at church. Now, there are times I am not in Lagos. Believe you me, on Sabbath, I'm keeping church somewhere. When I used to go and work in, in the East, and I was a medical rep, and I drive from Lagos to uh, Oweri, or Lagos to Abuja, to Maduguri. I try to make sure by Friday I'm heading back. If I cannot head back on Friday, I am keeping the church in the nearest church area. When I was doing my youth service, and I was served in Kano, in Sumaila local government, four hours, three hours plus outside Lagos, about 30 minutes to Jigawa, Every Friday afternoon, I'm heading to Bauchi, or I'm going to Yola, 
I'm going to yours. Where there's a church that meets in the house of one individual, or the church congregation in yours. Every Friday, all my copper allowance, whatever I can get, that's where they all went. That's where they all went. I don't think it was, I knew even then as young as I was. I wasn't because if I don't go, God is going to be upset with me. I, didn't, I wasn't doing it because I feel it makes God love me more. No, I knew it was for me. If I don't pray, you think it changes who God is? Of course it doesn't. He's still God. If I don't fellowship with the brethren, if I'm not a part of what the church is doing, it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change who God is. I believe it's all for my benefit. And I'm a part of it. And I tried to limit my excuses. But of course we know, we should understand what I'm saying, that there are going to be times when really there may be reasons or excuses why we simply cannot. I'm just saying let us make sure we don't flimsily easily put things ahead of what God actually wants to achieve with us. Luke 14, from verse 15. Luke 14, verse 15. One of them who sat at the table with him had these things. Christ was talking about people being a bit humble earlier. Before this, talking about them not looking for things of, you know, positions of authority, where they can be raising themselves up, trying to be the preeminent, you know, be humble minded, take lowly positions, don't, don't try to elevate yourself. So one of them said, hmm. When one of those who sat at the table with him heard this thing, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, a certain man gave his great supper and invited many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to those who are invited, Come, for all things are now ready. So these were his servants. He prepared his supper for them. And I said, you people, come, 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 come and eat. But when? But they all with one accord, with one voice, they agreed together among themselves. They began to make excuses. Now, I use the title, Excuses, Excuses, What Are Yours? When I said that's the title of the sermon, because like I said, whatever it is we may say, there are excuses. Of course, there are valid excuses. Excuses does not necessarily denote something negative, okay? Excuses simply in English means a reason why something cannot be done, period. But of course, excuses doesn't have to be negative, doesn't have to be, you know, but there are excuses that are good and there are excuses that are not good. So, so they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. It's like I just started a new business. I just got a new job. I just started this business. I just started working with this person. I just started working here. I just started doing this. And I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Was that a bad thing? Someone told me something he's been working on for five years will finally be launched on the 1st of October. On the 1st of October. And I said, that is good. Congratulations. It's cost a lot of energy. A lot of effort, a lot of money. Relatives and family are supported by sending money from abroad from various places. And finally, this program, this 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 thing was going to be launched first of October. And then feast was going to come up on the fourth or the fifth of October. Ah. I have roped in investors and so many people. Uh, I'm not sure this will work out well if I'm out. Of circulation for 10 days during this period but here's what I'm hoping is it possible for one to take their computer and be able to make phone calls and receive phone calls and discuss business issues 
and talk to people while at feast. I said, of course, there's only two holy days in the feast. The first day and the last day. When it's a Sabbath, you cannot do Sabbath work. The rest of the days, of course, we have service, and then you have the time, you can talk, you can do business, do whatever it is you want to do. But God says you must be at the feast. So if you need to make phone calls, you need to connect and have business meetings with people by Skype, of course you can do so. Say, ah, thank God. But what if it's, no, it's not possible? Okay? But my point is there was no reason why this person should even think of going. But because this person was think of not even disobeying, he thought of, okay, what is there, an, is there a solution? Or is this what is there? Sometimes it is when we don't want to do something or we are not invested in something that excuses stare us in the face and we see no way around it. We see no way around it. We need to be focused on doing. And if we are focused on doing, even valid excuses, we will find ways around them and we find a solid compromise. So the first one said, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excuse. There's nothing wrong with buying a piece of ground. I want to go see it. You need to see what you spent money on. Money doesn't grow on trees. There's nothing wrong with saying, look, I'm sorry. I, need, I just started this job. I just started this business. I need to see it established. I need to see it grounded. I mean, I just established this business and I'm having people working with me or working for me and I can't take it away for 10 days and leave it in their hands. I need to get this thing established. There's nothing wrong in that. But this is a question of God saying, come, follow me. Anyway, they began to have a student. Another one, verse 19 says, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask to have me, I ask you to have me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and therefore, I cannot come. Now that is a valid excuse, isn't it? Because in scripture, it says if a man gets married, it says for one year, he should be excused from everything, so that he can attend to his wife. I don't know why young men these days don't do that. <laughs> So, verse 21, that servant came. I think the women will send the guy away quickly after a week, or maybe a month at most. That servant came and reported these things to his master. So he went and reported to the master. So this master prepared this meal for the servants and invited them. He invited them. The master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Bring in those who don't even deserve to be here. Those who are not even part of my servants, my people. Bring them. Look at these people that I have things for. I'm looking out for their good. I'm looking out for their growth. And I'm taking time and energy to prepare various things. And guess what? Why do you think the master was angry? Because it's almost like all this energy, the effort is going to this is of no effect. And everybody thinks they have things better to do. It's a waste of my time. But you see, they all give reasons why they could not come. But it's still, it's still, still what? Excuses, as far as the master was concerned. Because he was angry. And he said, bring in those who do are just out there. And verse 22. Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then he says, go out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. It's simply use the word compel them. Sometimes we need to understand this. That when we who have been privileged and have been called by God, and things have been put in place for our growth and our good, and we seem to care little for it. Hmm. He did say to whom much is given, much is expected. And he did say that those who have little, the little they have might be taken away and given to those who have much. God might take away from us what he's given us and we do not value and we think we value our own things better and he'll give to those who might value it. The Bible says the kingdom of God suffers violence from the time of John the Baptist and the violence taken by force. The Hebrew word there, the connotation of, I mean, of the Greek word there is that the kingdom of God now requires sacrifice 
And it is those who are willing to make sacrifices that will get there. We make the mistake of often planning God's schedule around our time. Whereas it should be the other way around. The other way around. Our schedule around God because He's the one who gives us the power to do. He's the one who gives us that power to either produce well, to do His own good pleasure and to do His will. Brethren, we can give series of excuses for a lot of things. But I think that our level of commitments is often what is at stake. Our commitment level is shown by the excuses we give for not doing that what we need to do. Either to be at church, fellowship, I mean, we are familiar with Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Do not neglect the fellowship of one another as some are in the habit of doing. And Paul is dental, he says, it is when things are getting harder and harder that we should even do so more. As you see the day approaching, he said that's why we should even, when we see things getting tougher and tougher. Yet it's when things are tough and difficult for many people that they will stay away from the fellowship. Ah, uh, the Bible says it's a holy convocation. That is, God is there. When Hannah had problems, she came to the house of God and poured out her heart to God. By saying the house of God, it means where God's people are gathered. The place is holy, not because that house, God lives in there. No, it's because God's people are gathering there. When two or three are gathered in my name, he says, there I am in my midst. This youth instruction, Deuteronomy 6 youth instruction, is becoming, is now a bit more pertinent. We now have a number of youths in the church. We've upgraded our youth camp from just be strictly for teens. We now have preteens there. We have an eight-year-old at camp this year. And we have nine-year-olds. We're now having lots of children growing up. And children need to be taught when young. And the parents are the ones that are going to teach them. And those who do not yet have their own children need to also learn how to do that. I want to encourage us to look at this, that as we're starting some of this program, materials are going to be for the copy. And if possible, we might print actually some of them in full color, and we're going to give it out. And as the church recommends, the church recommends this is supposed to be for everyone, not only those who are parents. I'll give you an instance. In New York, New, New, New York there are two single mothers in that congregation, and each of them have a son, six-year-old and eight-year-old. Those are the only two children in the congregation. And you know what they do? These youth instruction materials are available on the website. Every member of the congregation downloaded it. And they will study it. And they take time, twice a month, the congregation after service will meet. All of everybody, congregation like this. And the Youth instruction materials have study guides for teachers, for adults. And when you say teachers, it means every single adult in the congregation. I'm not talking about the kids. And it's giving them tools on how they can learn better the things they are supposed to know and how they can teach this across to their children. And so every Sabbath, a member of the congregation, an adult member, it doesn't matter whether that one has a child or not, will actually adopt one of those kids for the Sabbath. So if the mothers come today, this one will now be the adopted father or the adopted mother of one of those kids. And they will sit with those kids during service, talk with them, interact with them. And they will be explaining to them what they have read and learned. And after service, they will sit with them and they will be teaching those children those things that they have learned from the youth instruction materials. That before you know it, the kids really feel that they have gained fathers and mothers from every person in the congregation. And everyone in the congregation can relate well with those children as if they're their own, even though those who are just singles who don't have children. How many of the singles in here are those who are married? 
or maybe not even, can name each of the children here one by one. Call their names. This one is Joy. This one is this. 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 How many people can name them? Where is Juan? Who knows who Juan is here? Don't raise your hand. Any of the adults? Who knows the child called Juan? Okay, a few. See? So, it is recommended that the entire church be a part of this. We are all of us will create time, and this has to be done. As I said, we will have to start this after the feast. This thing has been around, frankly, for about a year and a half, okay? And I think it's about time, as we're having all these young ones now, and parents, young parents coming up in the church, and perspectives also coming up. I think it's time we begin to look at this. And I'm hoping we will not have excuses this time. I have been at fault also in that excuses and excuses. I've also, I've also had my excuses. And my excuse is that ah, I've done this repeatedly for years. You know, workshops, seminars, this and that. And out of course, something people, you will see maybe 12 people. You know, the time, there was time we were having Bible study once a week, midweek Bible study. I mean, some of us remember, right? When is this? Five to six. Then the congregation was like 60 something, you know, consistently the number of people who used to attend, we have 10, we have 11. We ran it for like about two years when we were still at the church. And I was still living here. In case that those who think, well, it's easy for me to say because I live there. We were living here and I was still going to church. I was still have midweek Bible study every Wednesday, five o'clock to six o'clock. And after some time, I think it got to me that just too few people come. And then we organize church program, church activity, you organize a, a seminar, a workshop, you know. And then you see the quarter of the people attending. Last time we had a family activity for couples, and the invitation went out to all the couples, and I think there were about two thirds of those who were expecting that came. No excuses, or at least this time, for why those who did not turn up did not turn up. And of course, we prepared materials for everybody. Both the ones that are taking away materials and those that are taking materials. <laughs> those things could be really discouraging. But then, I think we need to stop excuses. I need to stop excuses. All of us need to stop excuses. We need to be involved. We need to be a part of something. Okay? We need to be willing to be committed. The people Christ told, talked about here in this parable, they are servants of this man. So they were already sort of like committed. Maybe I should read another. Let's read, read a little bit more. Another thing. Luke, same Luke chapter 9 to conclude. Luke chapter 9 from verse 57. I believe all of us are committed in one way or the other. But the problem is our commitment level has condition. Our commitment level has condition. Someone told me recently that as far as it's concerned, it's somebody who just learned about the Sabbath. Okay, we might think, oh, because it's new. He said, the moment I understood that Sabbath is from sunset to sunset, and yet that sunset, sunset is when they have business meetings. I told my directors, my staff, he said, I'm sorry, from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, Unless it's a matter of life and death, do not discuss business with me. We cannot do this meeting. Let us choose another time that we used to do this business meeting. Unless it's a matter of life and death, I do not want to discuss business meetings or business issues today. People who want to come and visit me on Saturday, you can come on Sunday. Or you come in the evenings. If I'm at home and you call me and I'm at home, I'll tell you come. But in most likelihood, I have planned that my entire Sabbath, if I'm going to spend it at church, so be. And I will 
never be in a hurry to rush away after service. Even if I look at, I ask, oh, isn't transport going to be a bit higher? She said, I'm going home. After all, when I go to work during the week, I come home sometimes 9 o'clock. So, she said, I'm going home. It's not my house. And it reminded me of someone. When he was young, he started going to church too. We'll be willing to stay at church, in fellowship, till everybody is going and the last person standing. Okay, everybody's going, let me go. Too. The Canadian lady who came here two Sabbaths ago with a guy, she's black American. Her parents, it wasn't last Sabbath? Oh, it was last Sabbath. Before, because last Sabbath is first day. That's true. Her mom is a UCG member. She unfortunately, she has five kids, three of them died, she has two left. She married someone who didn't remain in the church, and they left, and she left with him. And she said, when she came to Africa, to Nigeria, in Abia where she was, she was looking for a Sabbath group, and she found one Sabbath group. And the reason she didn't stay with them, and that's a bad group, of course, says she likes the concept of how to keep the Sabbath. And she thought that was how we too would be keeping the Sabbath. That's why when her mother kept insisting, go to UCG, go to UCG, she left the guy. UCG in America and Canada will be different from UCG in Nigeria. And she said, it's just no different from when she was in Canada or the times when she visited the US. She said the service is the same, the people in the fellowship the same way. Says no different. She thought she would have put Africans in inside. Mm -hmm. So because the one where she went, she cannot even put on her rings. She cannot do her hair. She cannot put on anything, even if it's uh, lip gloss or whatever. And she must put on a scarf. And what's most important, from Friday sunset, everybody has to be at church, and they will not live until Saturday sunset. <laughs> Maybe we should adopt that thing. Is that nice? <laughs> <laughs> I think we probably will have three or two people. <laughs> I said the Sabbath is for man. It's also a family time. And people need to have time to spend the Sabbath with their family and themselves as well. Luke chapter 9, verse 57, my Christian scriptures. When we do call for the membership to say, look, let's meet twice a week, twice a month, so we can learn how we can understand first. Because Deuteronomy 6 says, individuals first must put this thing in their own heart, in their own mind. So we want to learn how we can put it in our heart, in our own mind. And then we learn how we can teach this across. And then I want everybody, frankly, to be involved in this youth Bible disease. It's going to be, we want to shift the way we do this, our Sabbath, such that the parents have to frankly teach these children at home. And what we do in the Sabbath, during the Sabbath lesson, is going to be reviewed. And that review will take place at various times and will be handled by the various members in the congregation. And I want as many people as possible involved. It is recommended that the entire congregation adult membership who are willing to should be a part of this. So that all of us will be a part of teaching these children, but the primary responsibility is for the parents. And there are resources available for parents who must create time. They must, and I'm using the word must, because God didn't make it optional, to teach these children at home. And then during the service re review, those other members of the congregation will be a part of reviewing and teaching these things to the children in a form of review, not as if they are teaching them for the first time. So that they come together and it looks like, oh, you mean daddy didn't go through this with you at home? Oh, you mean mommy didn't go through this with this at home? Then that is where we need to talk to the parents. And you know what? You are failing your responsibility. You need to create the time. Create the time. And we will have to have adults who will be able to be willing and it will be rotational. We will have people, everybody involved, that in the review, 
We can have Sheo, we can have Namdi, we can have Mr. Lawai, we can have Mr. Okoro, we can have Mr. Agutayo, we can have Olumide, Mr. Uh, Sam, everyone, anyone can have two, three people who are going to sit with different children after service, and I know we want a fellowship or whatever, it could be before service, depending on our, what we are going to be organizing, and they will sit with them and reveal with them the lesson for that week or the lesson for that month. And we will coordinate this such that even the ministers and the speakers and all the people who are speaking will coordinate their messages for the entire month. We're going to have a topic of the month. We're going to be a bit more organized. And I think it's time this is done. That we can actually have a newsletter, frankly, that even if it's a single sheet of paper that we give out on a monthly basis that has the list of speakers for the entire month, the topic they're going to speak about, we need to do this. We need to have the time to do this. It's not going to be a fire brigade approach. It's not going to be only a few people at the time. Everybody needs to be involved. And I want all of us to understand this. But then, as I said, excuses, excuses. What's going to be your own for not being a part of this? Look, chapter 9, from verse 57. It happened as they journeyed on the road. And I'm reading this because there are people who are ready to commit to God. But they will commit on their own terms. They will commit as long as it doesn't take a lot from them. They will commit as it doesn't demand much from them. They are committed. They want to be involved. But they want to limit the level of commitment. Okay, as long as it doesn't interfere with maybe my business, maybe my spare time, or maybe this way. No, we have to be committed through and through. We have to be. Christ is not concerned about social issues, about political correctness. He's not concerned about uh, whatever it is all of us may think we have as excuses or reasons for not doing what he wants. 100%, I mean wholeheartedly, we're not involved. He wants wholehearted involvement. It is not half and half, not partial. You know I have commitments. You know I have this. We cannot walk by sight. We have to walk by faith. We limit what God can do in us because we think we can do it by our power, by our might. We think it's up to us. It's up to how much effort we put into it. And by extension, we limit what God can do with us because it's going to work according to our faith. It will be according to how we believe. You know how many times Christ will say, let it be to you according to your faith. And that's what we need to do. Okay, I'm reading now verse 57. It happened as a journey on the road. Someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Like all of us said, wherever you go, I will follow you. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Oh God, I will follow you as long as you don't ask me to pay a tithe of my income. Everyone. I mean, it's so small. God, I will follow you as long as you expect me to come to service on a regular basis because, you know, I live so far away. God, I will follow you except as long as you don't ask me to be a part of the men's club, women's club. You come for one Sunday on Sunday. Stay after service till 4 o'clock. Or do this. I will follow you. I will do whatever you want. As long as it doesn't cost this. Whatever excuses we might give. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That is not encouraging, is it? Oh, the Son of Man has huge mansions. Don't worry. There's going to be umbrellas in case of rain. In fact, you have a house to sleep in with air condition units. In fact, if you live in Shokoto, don't worry. We have buses that will be taking you there all the time. In fact, don't worry. Is it, are you coming from uh, Maduguri? Don't worry. We have ready made plane that will deliver you there. This is not encouraging. It's not telling them, don't worry, come to where I, where I am. Follow me or come to my fellowship, come to my garden, or come to my program. Because what? I have to buy this for you. Oh, I have this for you. He said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't even promising them he was going to take care of their basic needs. He wants the commitment first. Total commitment is exa exactly why Christ told this the rich young ruler in Luke. The man said, I've kept all these commandments. He said, how can I enter life? He said, keep the commandments. Which one? He started listening to the commandments. Oh, I've done this since I was a youth, you know. I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm a pretty good guy. He said, okay, that's nice. That's me. You want to be complete. You really want to be perfect. Drop everything. Okay? Come and follow me. Give yourself to me 100%. Be willing to risk everything for me. That's all he was asking. 
Perhaps you would be just like Abraham when God said, kill your son. And God said, oh, hey, I can see that you now obey me. Or now I know. Maybe that's what Christ would have told the rich young ruler. The guy shook his head and walked away. Because he had a great idol. What's the idol? His well. His pathos. What he has. Oh, they are so important. And he, he's a good guy. Goodness is different from righteousness. He's a nice guy. He really came to Christ. What do I need to do to enter life? And he's been diligent. He said, I, I've been keeping this since I was a youth. And he says, okay, I want you to risk all for me. And he couldn't do it. Then he said to another one, follow me. And that one said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Is there anything wrong really in burying someone's father? There's nothing wrong in it. There's nothing wrong in that. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. Really, I thought about this. Over the years, I used to think about this. Will burying one's parents prevents one from doing something that is required of God? Or should we look at burying one's parents as something that we can put ahead of something that is of God? After all, God didn't say, honor your father and your mother, right? And another said, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me go and bid them farewell, who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, it was a rebuke. It was a kind of a tongue-in-cheek response. No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Brethren, all of us, actually by being here, we have put our hand to the plow. We have shown our commitment to God. We've shown our willingness and desire to actually follow God. But let's dispense with all the social issues. Let's dispense with the political correctness involved in following Christ. Let's dispense with our personal agendas. Let's dispense with the excuses, the reasons why we cannot be a part of what God is working in our midst. And God has called us to be a part of this fellowship. It is not by chance. John 6, 65. No one, this is verse 24 as well, no one, no one comes to me, Jesus Christ said, Except the Father who draws, who, who draws them. His, his Father draws them to him. That's what he says. Nobody. Only God draws us. And if God has called us, then let's be committed. Let's dispense with all the excuses. No matter how valid, they just still want excuses. Let us find a way to put the things of God first. I will be amazed to see what he can do with us, through us, and by us. Excuses, excuses, what are yours? I hope you have none. I hope I have none too. I will just continue to do what is good and not be weary of doing it. So that's all. <laughs>